Well, my friends, as I mentioned in the introduction today, this week Lent begins with Ash Wednesday. And so as followers of Jesus, we embark on our Lenten journey with Jesus. And it starts today on this mountaintop with the transfiguration of Christ, and it will conclude on the hill called Golgotha. I invite you today to consider... Sorry about that, a little microphone malfunction. I, I invite you today to consider your own need for transformation. What needs to be transformed in you? What needs healing? What perspectives need transformation? What in you needs to go to the cross? We will watch over these next six weeks as Jesus journeys to the cross. And it's my hope that this would be an important journey for us all. So let's begin that journey today on the mountain of transfiguration. We'll be in Luke chapter 9. Let's read the scriptures together. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Now, this <clears throat> passage began with eight days later, so let me say what, explain what we're talking about. Those eight days previous, <clears throat> Jesus had predicted his capture, his death, and resurrection. And he had spoken to his followers about their, the, his invitation to them, his call to them to take up their cross and follow him. This had been the first time that Jesus had predicted what was to come, his capture, death, and resurrection. And so now eight days later, Jesus goes up this mountaintop with a few of his disciples and this incredible experience takes place. Now, in Luke's gospel, Luke says he was transformed. In Matthew and Mark, they use a slightly different word that says transfigured. Both things are similar, but the idea here is that something changed about Jesus' appearance. And in some way, he looked different. Now, it doesn't appear that this change stood, uh, uh, stayed with him as he went back down the mountain. But at least in this moment, in this mountaintop experience, this encounter with God... Something magnificent, certainly something supernatural happens. And we, we see that his clothes are dazzling white. And in some way, Jesus looks different. It was obvious that God had shown up in a powerful way. And now, of course, we have the disciples here with them, but we're, we're going to hear what they do here in just a moment. But next to Jesus, we see two figures, Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses and Elijah, they've been dead for hundreds of years, Okay. They represent kind of the pillars of the Jewish faith. They are two of the most important people and certainly the foundation of what the Jewish faith is all about. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. The law and the prophets together are the foundations, the pillars upon which this faith is built. And so Jesus in the middle of them representing the fulfillment of all of those scriptures coming together in the Messiah who's come to save the world. And so here we are, Moses and Elijah with Jesus, this incredible experience, and they're talking about something specific, about Jesus' exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. This glorious mountaintop experience, it's not about Jesus' exaltation. No, it's about the journey ahead and where that will end on a cross. We're going to come back to this in a moment. But let's keep reading. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of I laughed out loud when I first read this. Of course, here's another example of Jesus praying and the disciples sleeping. And uh, the, the next instance or another instance of this we'll see is that last night of Jesus' life as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives praying. 
in desperate need of support and encouragement, and the disciples are sleeping. And here again, Jesus has gone up on a mountain to pray. He's got his disciples with him, or some of them. And, and we, well, the picture we get here is that, you know, Jesus doesn't just show up to pray for a few minutes to just check in with God quick. I mean, th- this, is, this is a journey for Jesus to find time and space to rest in God's presence, to seek God earnestly in prayer. And we can only assume for hours, hours of conversation, resting in God's presence, presumably being prepared for this journey to come as Moses and Elijah are speaking with him about his exodus from this world. This is a, a, an incredible moment, a supernatural experience in which Jesus is being prepared for what is to come. And then, of course, we have Peter uh, acting as he so often does. It's just who he is. He acts before he thinks. And so Peter blurts out, Master, it's so good for us to be here. Let's build some shelters. And of course, there's no harm in this. This is human nature. And, and Peter's desire is that this moment could last, that this glorious encounter that he's experiencing would be something that he could just stay in. We can all relate to that, those moments of great peace or um, those moments where, where God comes near to us or where we experience God's presence. We want those things to last. And, and so Peter speaks what many of us would be thinking. Let's, let's make this permanent. Let's stay as long as we possibly can. But friends, it's not what Jesus' glory is about. His glory is not about basking in God's presence. The glory of Jesus will be revealed in a much more powerful way. Remember that they've been discussing what is to happen next. His glory will be revealed, not in these, this moment of dazzling light, but rather in his death and resurrection. Let's keep reading. Even as Peter was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Now this passage will conclude uh, with Jesus and the disciples going down the mountain and now moving steadfastly towards Jerusalem. And so we see that this moment is the central turning point in Luke's gospel. It began with an angel telling Mary that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and her child would be called the Son of God. And then at Jesus' baptism, God speaks, You are my dearly beloved Son and you bring me great joy. And now in this passage, this mountain of transfiguration, again, God speaks And Jesus' identity is affirmed. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You see, the transfiguration is the exact center of the gospel of Luke. And it both echoes how the story began as well as it foreshadows how it will end. And so there are two more mountains in Jesus' future. The Mount of Olives, that is the Garden of Gethsemane, that night in which he prays and is captured. And then there is also the Mount of Crucifixion, Golgotha. Of course, there Jesus again will not be alone. He will have two men with him, not Moses and Elijah, but two criminals. Perhaps most importantly on that mountain, Jesus is transfigured again. He is shown to be a different kind of Messiah than the disciples are expecting or are ready for. On the Mount of Transfiguration, we catch a glimpse of the divinity of Jesus literally shining through but in the crucifixion we catch a glimpse in fact we see clearly in jesus christ what that divinity is for it's for you and i it's for us when jesus is finally revealed in his glory we learn that his glory is not what we think we see his truly true glory looks an awful lot like glory's opposite. No, his true glory can be found in outstretched arms and bloodied hands and feet. As he pronounces the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That's the glory of Christ revealed. 
Which brings me to what this means for us. Jesus' death and resurrection means that you and I are not stuck in our brokenness. We are called, we are invited to new life in Christ. You and I are also called to be transformed. And I don't mean become perfect or holy or righteous in a human sense. Rather, this invitation to be transformed is to intentionally seek God's shaping and molding of our hearts and minds, our character and our integrity. Remember this, my friends. God's glory is revealed in Jesus as he gives his life away. So when we are transfigured or transformed or made into the likeness of Christ, it's as a humble servant as we take up our cross and follow, as we lay down our lives in love. So this week does indeed begin Lent with Ash Wednesday. And as followers of Jesus, as we embark on this journey with Jesus from this mountaintop of transfiguration to the hill called Golgotha, I pray you will see this journey as an opportunity To follow Jesus in a way maybe you haven't before. To look for signs of a new life that God is beckoning you toward. After all, the journey, it won't end at Golgotha, actually, but rather at an empty tomb. Let's not forget we are resurrection people. And just as there is life after the tomb, well, there is new life for you and me. So may we look to the cross to be transformed into the likeness of the one who has claimed us, redeemed us, and saved us. My friends, you are dearly loved. And so may that love change you. And may we together, as God's people, may we change the world with that love. Yes, let's journey with Jesus to the cross. Let's make room for God to transform our hearts and minds. And let's see together how we can transform this world through God's love, through the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, you know how often we are like Peter. We we wish for those glimpses of your glory to last forever. We wish that we could rest in that place of just complete peace and awe of you. And yet, Lord, we are called down the mountain, not away from your glory, but to discover what your glory is really all about, about taking up a cross and following, about giving our lives away in love. Lord, you know better than we do what needs to be transformed in us. We give you thanks that you don't reject us in our brokenness. Rather, you you draw us in to renew us, to save us. You claim us in the midst of our brokenness and offer to us the healing that we need. And so, God, help us to be transformed. Help us to turn to you each day seeking your spirit's whisper in our ears, seeking your beckoning towards a new life, a life marked by your mercy and grace and your love. God, we know that we are not all you hope for us to be, and yet we know that you love us exactly as we are. And so help us to live in that tension, the already but not yet, knowing that this journey, although it will pass through Golgotha, will end in joyful resurrection. May we live in that new life each and every day, and may we offer it to this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.